we don't want you to, you know, you know I am well, the one. Well, uh, there, there's, there's a terrible um, stigma attached yes, to what atheists do. I hope we change that, too, as we go. Um, what do you want? Why are you there? What do you want to accomplish? The coalition was formed because of concern about how much government was getting into, uh, sorry, religion, church and state was getting mixed. And so uh, let me give you a good example. Right now, the main thing we're lobbying on. <laughs> so, and, and, and we're not going to get to the first clip until, oh, probably 20 minutes into this. So I don't know what that means for AB and life. <laughs> so when I accepted this job, I, I have to admit, I was more excited about the prospect of living in my favorite city, Washington, D.C., and finally working at a dream job for a political junkie like myself than I was about the topic I would be lobbying on, non-theists' rights. I had spent decades working on reproductive rights and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender equality. I had served as National Education Association diversity trainer traveling the country dealing with difficult racial, ethnic, and other minority issues. So I was not certain that giving a voice to non-theists in the halls of Congress was necessarily the most important thing I could be doing. However, it took less than 24 hours for me to realize that what I now do for a living is tremendously important to the daily lives of the approximately 30 million non-theists in the United States. On my first day on the job, USA Today newspaper published an article about the Secular Coalition for America and my hire. On that first day, people around the country read the article, and emails and phone calls started pouring in. Most were from parts of the country I had never lived in. Tennessee, Texas, Alabama, the panhandle of Florida, areas known as the Bible Belt and the South. Having grown up in New York and spending most of my life in Las Vegas, Nevada, and living in Los Angeles during law school, the most uncomfortable thing about answering questions regarding my belief was that some people would automatically dislike me for not sharing a God with them. But the calls and emails I received that day were from people who were frightened and hiding their beliefs. One man who sounded elderly seemed to be near tears on the phone as he told me, I've never told anyone this before, and I was even afraid to make this phone call. But I don't believe in a God, and I'm so glad you were there doing this work. And he also asked if I could refer him to a local affiliate of one of our groups. Others recounted how they had lost a job suspiciously close in time to their boss, finding out that they didn't have a deity belief. That day and during the months that followed, the most disturbing stories I heard were about how children throughout the United States were being treated. Brenda Fry of Florence, Texas, <coughs> described how her daughter was pushed against a fence during public school recess, and the sign of the cross was made on her daughter's forehead because Brenda's family identified as atheist. Another parent was dealing with his son's football coach, telling the team that the boy was evil because he didn't attend church. A third gentleman was accused of assault, but later proved completely innocent when he objected to his daughter, daughter's forced participation in prayer while on a public school basketball team. The harassment this family dealt with after the complaint led to both teenagers who had been attending public school being homeschooled instead. And in fact, one of your members, Allison Page, was in the same position after being harassed and physically choked at school for not for standing up for what she believed in. And by the way, can we give Allison another little round of applause? Because this is a great young woman. I mean, to put up with what her classmates were doing and still say, I don't believe in that, was really bold. Um, thank you, Allison, for letting me share that too. I had asked her permission. Another mother who gave me permission to share an email she sent writes or wrote last year. About a month ago, a friend who knew my 10-year-old daughter was an atheist announced to the other kids at school, Kira doesn't believe in God. She came home in tears and said the other kids were all angry at her and wanted to know what's wrong with her. Her best friend turned on her and another girl said to her, you disgust me. The remarks from the other kids went on for a couple of weeks to the point where a staff member at the school overheard one of the girls and had to have a talk with her. My daughter had been very quiet about this and didn't even tell me the teasing was going on or still going on. She came here from she came from Christian school to a public school, 
and she said to me, I thought at least here there would be one or two people like me. And that's a school where at least the teachers try doing something about it. Sometimes the kids are harassed by their teachers. Other children were being ostracized and had no friends because they didn't say under God in the pledge. This is especially offensive because so many people say to me, it doesn't matter at all if public schools lead children in the revised post-1954 version of the pledge. It's just symbolic. Well, of course it matters. In some parts of the country where public schools are being used to divide children based on religion, and it is especially distressing when we consider the history of the original phrase, one nation, indivisible, written shortly after the Civil War and how the 1954 edition was placed in between those words which had brought us together during a time when non-theists were the scapegoats for McCarthy's witch hunt. So I realized very quickly on that first day and days after the value of having an organization whose mission is to increase the visibility and respectability of non-theistic viewpoints in the United States and to protect and strengthen our secular character of government as the best guarantee of freedom for all. I mentioned that the other church-state separation groups welcomed the secular coalition with open arms. You might be wondering how members of Congress reacted to a lobbyist explicitly representing non-theists. In case there's any doubt about their understanding of some of the constituencies covered under the non-theist umbrella, my business card, which I have handed to about half of the United States Senators, dozens of House Representatives, and scores of congressional staffers, states across the middle, atheists, humanists, freethinkers, Americans. And how do these folks I lobby react? I have always, without exception, been listened to and treated with respect. The Secular Coalition has had legislative successes, and while we generally target persuadable members, when constituents from around the country visit D.C., we take them to their congressional representatives' offices regardless of how much those representatives might oppose separation of church and state. Even in the offices of Congress members who I wouldn't normally target, whose rhetoric discloses a theocratic mindset, we have been listened to respectfully. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we represent information or that we present them with information about specific bills and how these bills affect non-theistic Americans or why non-theistic Americans care about these church state issues. I respect every American's right to hold whatever beliefs they wish to hold. I only object to attempts to impose others' theology on me or my government and actions which do harm to my constituency based solely on our belief system. Some of the areas we've lobbied on include attempts to strip the Head Start program of civil rights protections against religious discrimination in hiring, vouchers to fund religious education. By the way, there was a recent General Accountability Office report that came out last month, and we'll have an analysis of that up on our website within about a week that you can look at, which basically one of the big things it mentioned is there were hardly any secular alternatives for which private schools you could use these vouchers at. In fact, there really weren't any, um, except some of the preschool and Afrocentric schools, and that was it. And the rest were all Protestant, Catholic, or Muslim. We also lobbied against the Federal Marriage Amendment, which attempted to impose a theological definition on civil marriage contracts. We lobbied for expanding the stem cell lines, which National Institutes of Health are permitted to use in their research, uh, for deleting an earmark appropriation to a creationist organization for the purpose of crafting science curriculum. By the way, after the recent defeat of this earmark, that money will instead be used to purchase lab equipment for science classes and computers. We also opposed other earmarks for religious purposes, and even though we didn't get them taken out of the bill, since the President vetoed the first appropriations bill, we had a chance to go back, and at least in the second bill, they're getting less money. Though still enough to start a lawsuit, for example, over federal money going to Morningstar Ranch, which is a Christian evangelical uh, troubled youth bring them to Jesus place that shouldn't be funded with federal money. <laughs> uh, we also lobbied against the abstinence only until marriage federal funding. And uh, again, after the first one was 
vetoed. The second one has a lower level of funding, though not as low as Senator Harkin face-to-face -face had promised.